What were some of the most surprising things you've encountered with gallium nitride? Gallium nitride worked despite it having so many imperfections inside. And it still now has so many imperfections. If you take the same number of imperfections and trying to build a silicon device or a gallium, nit- gallium arsenide device with the same number of imperfections, it wouldn't work. You could say gallium nitride defies physics or defies engineering. It doesn't. And that has baffled me at the time when I was getting into that field. It surprised me. I didn't think it's going to work either. And that, it still baffles me now. Welcome to Innovational Correctness, a podcast all about innovation and transformation, hosted by David Luna, author, keynote speaker, and founder of Gamma Digital and Beyond. David and his guests discuss real-world practical advice on how to best harness the creativity of your employees and go from idea to product, giving you unique perspectives and insights into their success, all while separating hype from reality and replacing bullshit bingo with common sense. Let's jump right into the show. Welcome to another episode of the Innovational Correctness Podcast. What I'm currently holding my hand that you unfortunately can't see because this is obviously a podcast is a small cube. To be exact, it's about 3.8 times 3.5 centimeters or 1.4 times 1.5 inches for you Americans out there. And it weighs about 60 grams and it's slightly smaller than a golf ball. And it puts out a whopping 30 watts up to 3 amps without barely getting warm. And this will also be the topic of today's episode. Well, actually, it's a special material that's built into the supercharger. And the material I'm referring to is called gallium nitrite, or GAN for short. Most of you have seen or experienced gallium in science class or seen videos on YouTube where people put gallium on their hands as its melting point is around 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Where things get really interesting is when we combine it with the element nitrogen. This creates gallium nitride. Some materials like copper are really good at conducting electricity, whereas materials such as glass are not. As some of you might remember from school, semiconductors are about halfway between those two extremes, which makes them really versatile for different products and use cases. What makes gallium nitrite so special is it's a super efficient semiconductor. How efficient? Well, with GAN, you lose about 1% of the energy that you're trying to convert versus a silicon device that only loses about 3%. That might not sound like much, but as the vast majority of things include silicon, that's huge. Just for reference, you'd save about 10% of electricity consumption just in the U.S. alone by using gallium nitrate nitrite technology. What this means is that gallium nitrate can replace many materials that are currently being used in the silicon electronics industry today. Gallium nitrite could also pave the way for a whole new generation of miniaturized and vastly more efficient tech. In practical terms, this could also allow power to go straight from the outlet into your laptop, for instance, and make electrical cars or solar cells much more efficient. And you need gallium nitrite electronics to make this happen. My guest has been in involved in gallium nitrite research for over 20 years. And during this time, gallium nitrite has already been used in quite a few applications, but semiconductors are where gallium nitrite will really take off. My guest today is Martin Kubel. Martin is a multi-award winning professor and director of the Center for Device Thermography and Reliability at the University of Bristol in the UK. His team, about 20 international researchers and PhD students, work with industry and academia across the globe to develop the next generation of technology for communication, microwave, better solar cells, and more efficient power transmission. So in this episode, we'll explore what gallium nitrite is in detail, the properties that makes this material so extraordinary, what advantages gallium nitrite has compared to silicon, how GAN is disrupting the silicon industry, what challenges there are when developing GAN devices, what common misconceptions people have about this material and what aspects are overhyped, what it really takes to go from research to a groundbreaking innovation and how much effort goes into producing next generation technologies, how our future could look like once gallium nitrate and next generation batteries are widely deployed, what types of skills researchers need to have in order to go from research to product, and finally, 
the biggest surprises and breakthroughs my guest has had during his career as a scientist. All right, that's it. Let's go meet Martin. Welcome to the podcast, Martin. Do you want to tell the listeners who you are and what you're currently up to? My name is Martin Kowal. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. I'm director of the Center for Device Thermography and Reliability. And we work a lot on electronics, on next generation electronics, which we think is exciting and opened a lot of opportunities for mobile phones, for power conversion to make our society what we hope better. So you also work with what's called gallium nitrite. So maybe you could explain to the listeners, who most are probably not professional chemical or physical engineers, what gallium nitrate is, what its basic properties are, and what makes it so special. So yes, we work in gallium nitrate. I will work in, in a class of materials which are called wide band gap or ultra wide band gap materials or semiconductors. Gallium nitrate, gallium oxide, diamond. Just to tell a little bit about what gallium nitrate is, I mean, it's it's a material which contains 50% gallium and 50% nitrogen. It's a solid material. The atoms are arranged in a beautiful regular pattern. And the material is kind of that exists two different types of gallium nitrate. One type of gallium nitride, the atoms are arranged in kind of a cubic fashion. But what is more common, and we work on where the gallium nitride is arranged in a hexagonal pattern. And the cool stuff with this material is that if you have electrons traveling through it, which you have in many electronic devices, they travel very fast through this material, much faster than you, for example, have in silicon. And why is that so crucial that electrons can move faster? I mean, faster always seems better, but, you know, why is that relevant? So faster means, what's the benefit? I mean, there, let's look at two different applications of gallium nitrate in electronics. I mean, probably seen gallium nitrate actually used at home. I mean, it's used for light emitting dyes, for white LEDs and lightning. But what we look at is electronic applications. So I apply a voltage to this thing, like if I have your mobile phone, there are voltages inside and the electrons going forth and back very quickly. And the faster they go forth and back, the easier, the better it is in many cases. How you can communicate with someone else around the planet and somewhere in, in Europe, somewhere in Asia. And this makes it actually much more efficient, the communication. On the other hand, if I think about what we call power conversion, so where you have, for example, your laptop plugged in into an outlet, what you find if these electrons move faster around, the efficiency of actually charging your laptop is much better the faster the electrons can travel. Or if you have an electric vehicle, if you connect it to a power outlet, the efficiency charging your car is much higher. That means it can be faster charged, but also you have less energy loss. You mentioned some of the advantages that gallium nitrite has. Now, the question I would have, and assume most of the listeners, is if it has such advantages, why hasn't everything moved from silicon to gallium nitrite? I mean, silicon has been a long, long time around, and silicon is good and is being heavily used. And if you look at, you develop a new material, theoretically, it's better than, for example, silicon, but it takes a long time to bring it to the level where you can actually really compete with silicon. Take an example. I mean, I have to make the material, I have to grow the material, then I have to fabricate this material in something useful, and then I need to make sure that whatever comes out, like an electronic device or a power charger, will last a long period of time. And this process takes 10, 20 years. In and therefore, only now you start seeing this gallium nitrate really happening and appearing. And this is the reason why actually this is happening actually at that moment in time. But silicon still is very useful just to make this clear. It complements what, what, what semiconductors can do. It enables more what semiconductors can do. And it offers more opportunities. Like I can talk over longer distance, I can charge something faster, as I pointed out. Yeah, I personally experienced what gallium nitrite technology can do in form of a charger. I have a charger from a well-known, respected Chinese company, and that little cube, and it's really, really small, can put out up to, I believe, 35 watts, anywhere between one and a half amps up to three amps, and it generates very little heat. So it's quite astonishing what gallium nitrite can do without developing much heat at all. So you mentioned an aspect that I would like to highlight and ask you a follow-up question. Growing such materials could take anywhere between 10 and 20 years. And I think consumers 
we tend to be spoiled and underestimate the effort that goes into research or researching groundbreaking technologies because, hey, if we get a, an iPhone every single year, we expect that from every company and every groundbreaking innovation. And I think that's unfair. So maybe you could explain what it essentially takes to go from research to a commercially viable product and how much time and effort goes into such product that then millions of consumers can enjoy its benefits. For instance, my gallium nitrate charger. So maybe you could kind of illustrate for the consumers out there what it really takes to go from research to product. If you look, for example, at an iPhone or anything, basically, you build, you buy components in from across the planet, you design it. So this actually makes it um, quite quick to you. You can just buy a component and a week later, I'm going to get um, my device and I can actually put something together. But if I build effectively a new electronic component, like take gallium nitride as example. It's a beautiful example, actually. Like gallium nitride is not a perfect material, what you find. And that makes it also exciting. Like if I take silicon, silicon, every atom sits where it's supposed to sit. In gallium nitride, since it's a little bit more difficult to make, some atoms are the wrong location. That's initially fine, but the more you go towards the devices, sometimes the wrong location of the atom make the device not working so well. So you need to actually find the understanding what Tobin calls a defect in a material in these gallium nitrides. There are plenty of those. Is acceptable what is not acceptable. And if it's not acceptable, you have to find to engineer these defects out. And this process just takes very long. It's much more complicated than me going to an ordering site of an electronics company and buy a resistor or buy a capacitor or buy a transistor. The money being invested into actually developing these is, is a huge amount of money. So this is just a bit more complicated, just the next generation of iPhone. Yeah, that makes me appreciate how much research goes into such groundbreaking technologies such as gallium nitrite. So from what I understood is you can't just take gallium nitrite as is, as in, it's available in nature, but you actually have to create a process that reduces its defects and alter its nature so it can then be used for its intended application. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, you have to alter defects and there will be always defects in the material, but some are benign, don't matter. So this is actually, there's a lot of physics going in there and there's a lot of chemistry going in there, a lot of engineering going in there. And these three different disciplines and probably other ones actually have to work together. So could one generalize and say the higher the voltage requirement is for a certain application, the more suitable gallium nitride would be? Could one say that? Yeah, in principle, you can say, I mean, silicon typically is more for the vo lower voltage range in a simplistic term. And the more power and more, more voltage you have, better some of these so-called wideband gap technologies like gallium nitrides come into play. If we recognize that gallium nitride has a lot of advantages, why not make the complete switch to gallium nitride? Or asked another way, how abundant or how scarce is gallium nitride as a material? Gallium nitride is way more scarce than silicon. Silicon you find everywhere. But what you find in these gallium nitride devices, the gallium nitride layers in these devices are only a few microns thin. So about a hundredth of a human, uh, the diameter of a human hair. So the amount of material of the gallium, which is quite sparse, nitrogen is not, is fine because you don't actually need a lot of this material. Generally, compared to silicon, you can apply much higher voltages to gallium nitride devices. So silicon is usually because of low voltage technology, not always. I mean, there's some, some tricks you can play with silicon. And because of this, you can actually build very efficient. I mean, iPhone is, is kind of, you're holding up, there are a few volts, voltages in there. But if you have a car charger, these can be hundreds of volts, basically. And this is something where you need some non-silicon technology. And here, if you look about environmental benefits, it would be great if each of us drives an electric car. It would be very good for our environment. But you need a lot of power charges. And this is what this gallium nitride technology and that's alternative technology based on silicon carbide can actually really deliver. So if we look back to the 1990s, and according to my research, gallium nitrite has already been used in LEDs back then. Has there been a resurgence all of a sudden of gallium nitrite? Or why are we seeing gallium nitrite in other applications such as chargers, uh, radars, and etc.? Why, why is that the case? What, what changed? 
I mean, it's not really research, and this has always a fact of really going on. LEDs are easy to make. People started with the LED, and these electronic devices, power switches, for example, are more difficult to make than LEDs. I mean, they started also in 1993 or rough, roughly like this. But what you find in these power switches, because devices are smaller, the voltages are higher, there are high electric fields in the materials, so the materials degrade faster if you don't do it right. So it just took longer, actually, to develop the electronic materials. And actually, the electronic side of gallium nitride benefited a lot of the LED from the LED side because there's so much investment money flowing into gallium nitride making how to make better material. And LEDs have resulted into resulting in making better gallium nitride material. And with this, you see now the benefit also outside the LED market that gallium nitride electronic devices come into. Obviously, no material is perfect. So what are some of the drawbacks that gallium nitride has? What are some of the environmental impacts that gallium nitride has when compared to other materials? I mean, environmental drawbacks, I mean, you have people use different chemicals to do different materials. So that plus or minus is using silicon and not silicon. But what you typically find, which is a positive side on the environmental benefit, firstly, obviously, they're more efficient. You need less energy for a device which has gallium nitride in there. But also, because the devices or the, or the circuits you build with gallium nitride tend to be more simple than what you need to do with silicon. So you actually need less components. So if there's an environmental impact that will be more positive than negative. So at what point could we see other applications that go beyond just chargers? So for instance, when could we potentially see gallium nitrite CPUs as gallium nitrite seems to be much better at thermal management? Or does that even make sense? I mean, the CPU market, from my viewpoint, will be domin continue to be dominated by silicon. The alternative aspects around so people look at a few other techniques. But I personally don't see gallium nitride to have, at least in the short term, a mid-term, have a major impact on the CPU market uh, because of silicon is simply better in this field at that moment in time. So for digital, what one calls electronic gallium nitride is usually less suitable than silicon. So I would assume as a consumer that if I can overclock or provide more voltage to the CPU, the more performance I get, but the less heat I have using gallium nitride, so it would be better thermal management. But I assume there's much more involved in that. Is that the case? It's much more involved in that. I mean, typically you like to actually stay at a lower voltage market to have it more efficient. And that's what silicon has been trying to do. And just from the properties of the materials, one calls silicon is a narrow band gap material. It's a very perfect material. You have you lose very little number of carriers inside CPU. It's gallium nitride. There's, there's more defects in there. It's more tricky to use for that particular area. Um, there were also aspects of what one calls linearity. So there are certain key material properties where simply silicon is still better and will stay better because it's a narrow band gap material. And how much effort, generally speaking, would it be for a silicon-based manufacturer of, say, chargers to switch to gallium nitrate electronics? So switching the whole process from silicon to gallium nitrate. It's not difficult. I mean, you have to redesign the circuit around it. But from the production side, if you have a gallium nitrate or silicon component, you can just switch over. It's a lot of mentality or different thinking this is obviously slowing a little bit the process over of the switch designers have to think different designers know silicon very well people feel comfortable with silicon so it takes some time for them to adapt to different technology people worry about the reliability so how long a material device will operate people are certain silicon will operate for a long period of time gallium nitride People may think, I'm not sure, I haven't you worked with it yet. So it just needs a bit different thinking. But from the production facility, not a lot of change is needed. So how much pushback do you see in regards to gallium nitride from the very well-established silicon industry? Because I would assume if I am a very established industry and have invested heavily into my processes, my factories, and so on, I'd want a proper return of on investment. So I could assume that there is a lot of pushback as with, you know, most new technologies. 
What, what's your take on that? That's actually a very interesting question. So obviously they invested in it and obviously you want to have a return. So that's natural with people trying to actually continue with silicon. But you also have the existence of gallium nitride actually pushed silicon manufacturers to make better silicon device by using new concepts. So gallium nitride exists and even pushed silicon into making better devices. But what you also see um, from the manufacturer side, I mean, there's something which one calls a wafer size. So if I make these electronic devices or devices in general, they start as round plates of material where you put, for example, gallium nitride down, or if you have silicon, you just work with silicon. You put that in processing machines and they make little devices on these wafers and they get later on cut off into small little pieces. So what you have in silicon technology, people started at first as a wafer size, maybe itself. It's like four inch, six inch, eight inch, 10 inch, and so on, making it bigger and bigger, which makes it cheaper. So the silicon manufacturer is using actually quite large pieces of silicon nowadays. This is an expensive process. You have to change the machines to make them accommodate bigger wafer size. But what you also have for many of the manufacturers now, the old machines, which were used for the silicon a, long, a number of years ago, which don't have these large wafer sizes, can actually accommodate the gallium nitride. So what you actually find, most silicon companies, power companies, which make the devices, also start making gallium nitride devices because they can use the old machines because they work with small wafer sizes for the new technology. So there's a pushback to continue using silicon, but there's also taking the benefit of, hey, I have these old machines. I can use them to make a new next generation device. That's very interesting because it sounds very much like low-end disruption. Low-end disruption generally starts off with worse quality or worse performance than the incumbent, so in this case, silicon. And it reminds me of the steel industry. So back in the uh, 60s, the mini mills, they used scrap metal instead of producing steel with iron ore. So they only produced steel that was of low quality and thus only produced rebar that was used in the construction industry. But over time or very quickly, they improved their performance and quality issues and moved up market. And so the incumbents, as always, they always move more up market because the lower markets are not of interest and mainstream customers tend to reject this new technology because, again, it's worse off than what we have today. So it reminds me very much of blow end disruption. Is that the case or am I seeing this completely wrong? I mean, that's, that's exactly how it is. Gallium nitro was much worse off than other technologies and now is overtaking them. And when I went into that business of gallium nitride many, many years ago, I was working in the US at that moment in time. You were going to a meeting of conferences, people presenting whatever they're looking at a different technology. These conferences were 95% silicon, gallium arsenide, indium phosphate technologies and maybe five percent of the people talked about gallium nitride you know, people turning up into these sessions of gallium nitride and looking at this material is really bad you will never be able to compete against my silicon because it was at that moment in time really not good and then you start making the material better and better and better and you overtake it. and so it's a, sim a good comparison to the steel industry it's it's a similar game you start lower and then higher Okay, so gallium nitrate does seem to be on a very disruptive path then. If gallium nitrate does have some of these great properties and gallium nitrate transistors are generally faster and more efficient than, say, classical silicon devices, what other challenges or limitations are keeping it from currently unseating the silicon as, uh, on, its, on its throne? I mean, in some sense, some areas is because silicon from the material properties will always be better than gallium nitride in the lower voltage market regime. Gallium nitride would not be able to really compete. What you also have, silicon is a proven technology which is very reliable. The devices last for a long period of time. Obviously, gallium nitride is still trying to establish itself to say this is what one calls a lifetime and calls a more specifically mean time pay a lifetime so that people say my device will last five years or ten years. And this is some of the challenges what gallium nitrate still needs to really demonstrate. In some areas it's very demonstrated good reliability. In others it still needs to demonstrate. There are also some aspects because gallium nitrate isn't the perfect material. So there are some tweaks in how you make these imperfections to have a less impact on the technology to improve the performance better. But silicon is just a proven technology. People trust the designer 
their traffic. In gallium nitride, people still have to prove in areas. But apparently the charges for, for are from different companies seem to be well accepted. I have the same experience which described earlier, kind of charges very quickly and doesn't get very hot. It starts happening now. Now, there are currently rumors, and again, rumors, I couldn't back this up with any facts or uh, any other evidence, but there are rumors that Apple will introduce a gallium nitrite charger. So if we take Apple as a mainstream producer of phones and charger and, oh yeah, dongles, uh, then it seems that gallium nitrite is going mainstream, at least slowly. Is that the case? I mean, I don't know what Apple is doing, um, but I would not be surprised if they are thinking doing. So. And it's also just worthwhile keeping in mind, okay, what we're talking here um, is gallium nitride for power electronics, so like for charges and things like that. But there's also, we talked about gallium nitride for LEDs, which is well established for light, white, white, white um, light bulbs. But there's a third field as well, which I mentioned in between sometimes a bit, which is gallium nitride for mobile phone base stations, for radars, for some aspects like that. And this is a, a market in between where gallium nitride is less established than for light emitting dye, but much more established than for power electronics for charge application, because at least the quarter probably more of all mobile phone base stations right now use gallium nitride already so gallium nitride is a different market penetration stages in, in for different applications so if we take gallium nitride chargers that can output much more power into say a tablet a, a notebook a phone etc lithium batteries don't like this higher output for the simple fact that it produces a lot of heat and then degrades the battery. So the question now becomes, are our devices ready for gallium nitrite for these superchargers, if you will? I mean, obviously, if you have a new charger technology, you want to look at new batteries. I mean, you can use gallium nitride devices with current batteries. Obviously, as you correctly said, there are limitations. So you probably can use a full muscle power a gallium nitride device could deliver to, to actually charge the battery because it wouldn't like it. But then you, and there's a lot of research going on in new battery research. I mean, the graphite batteries which use graphene, uh, which have some benefits. So if you develop new battery technology, then you can actually really take full advantage of gallium nitride. How far are we from a future like that where we really have true abundance of gallium nitrite? So from you as a researcher, that puts it in a more realistic perspective of how far away are we from using much more gallium nitrite devices of any kind. What's, what's your estimate? A few years. I mean, it's, it's ramping up now. So you, it's not going to be now 1% of people use gallium nitrite and tomorrow 100% use gallium nitrite. So it's a trend which is increasing. But you see that increasing over time in a few years you have more gallium nitride devices a few years after that even more gallium nitride devices well that sounds very promising what are some misconceptions that people have about gallium nitride that aren't really true that it's very expensive if you go to catalog for example if you would be manufacturer of something you look at the price of a silicon device or you look at the price of a gallium nitride device silicon is cheaper and gallium nitride more expensive but what people sometimes or the misconception lies is if I build a circuit with silicon devices or if I use a gallium nitride device, the circuit using a gallium nitride device is actually cheaper because you need less components. So there's a big mix misconception in, in that side and some part of the technology sector. Wouldn't the lack of scale also influence the price of gallium nitride? It's certainly true. The scale of silicon is a bigger wafer, so it's going to be cheaper. Also for gallium nitride devices, typically these are gallium nitride on silicon wafer devices. The silicon isn't an active part, but it's just a carrier. So it will always be more expensive than a silicon device because you start with silicon, add something to it. Scale is one reason why it's more expensive, but it's just a little bit more expensive to make in general. And what parts of this technology do you find completely overhyped? And which parts do you think are mostly overlooked? Probably overhyped, in, but that's in any material sector, is the statement, gallium nitride can do everything, or any material can do everything. But that's not very realistic. Each material has their place in the food chain. The gallium nitride will be outperforming in silicon in some sectors, not in all sectors. It will be outperforming what one calls the silicon carbide technology in some sectors, but not in all 
other sector. So that's something where it's a bit overhyped. What is forgotten and actually what we're working on right now is that you can actually make materials better, gallium nitride, by actually integrating with some other technologies, like we work on gallium nitride integrated with diamond, so that gallium nitride can deliver even more power than a typical gallium nitride device, by at least a factor of three or a factor of six. So there are opportunities even now for gallium nitride, and there are also opportunities for young researchers or young people to get involved into that research. It's not dead. A lot of it's not finished. It's a lot of opportunities coming up. Yeah, I think this is something that I and a lot of consumers tend to forget is when you have a material that's really, really good in certain areas and certain applications, they're particularly bad or worse off in other contexts or applications. So there's always a trade-off in the special properties a material has. And the first time I've heard of gallium nitride, I was like, oh, cool, this can do a lot of interesting things. Let's gallium nitride everything. But again, we tend to forget that there's always a, a trade-off. How would a future with gallium nitride technology and graphene batteries look like? So if we could combine both technologies and going beyond just car chargers, how would our future change or how would a future look like where we would have both technologies? So having very fast charging capabilities with little heat, but also the batteries that can take large amounts of power and charging without getting hot. How would something or how would a future like that look like? You could think about electric planes, for example. You could think about, obviously, I mean, obviously we talked about car chargers, but just spending very little time to charge your car. I mean, right now, if I go to a gas station, it's very quick to fill my gas tank up, but for a car charger, it will take me longer. Um, I could think about my laptop not having a power brick at all, but just being straight plugging into an outlet. Um, I could have, I mean, with these graphene batteries, which have a good storage capability, stays days and weeks, maybe just not charging things at all. A lot of opportunities. Wouldn't it then become an arms race between the manufacturer of devices where they say, now that I have much more battery capacity and can charge much, much faster, now I can build in these 15 CPUs instead of just 10. Wouldn't that then become just an arms race between the capabilities or capacities that I have and what I can do with those? Yes. Yes, certainly. I mean, this, I mean there has been also lots of... Um, history not only from the arms race but in technology someone um, makes something more efficient and you can drive more power to get even more out i mean we've seen it in the laptops um if you go 10 years back laptops did a job now they can do about 10 times more of them but they use the same power so it's a balance of what people want and how much environmental fo carbon footprint want to actually make and people are probably nowadays much more aware of that Humanity should be actually looking at the carbon footprint. So I hope there's a, some sanity in the game. Yeah, let's hope there is some responsibility left in us humans. So for companies to continue to essentially delight consumers with products they really love and that provides benefits, there's always a need for higher performance at a lower cost. So in your view, is gallium nitrite alone enough to satisfy this constant need for improvement? Or what else do we need for that to become reality? I mean, first of all, gallium nitrite needs to be implemented wider. Obviously, it's only starting to implement it. That will happen naturally without having its benefit. But then it's also important to realize there are materials already now in the pipeline at a much lower, what one calls technology ready level readiness level, so much earlier in the development, which will add additional capabilities, like there's a new material which people get very hyped about right now, also using gallium, which is called gallium oxide, where people think that could also provide some benefits. This is more for even higher voltage applications than gallium nitride will make power transmission or even more efficient for power transmission lines. So there's a lot of other materials development coming which will complement what silicon can deliver, what gallium nitrate can deliver, what silicon carbide can deliver. And that makes it so exciting and fun to work in this field. It never stops. There are more opportunities to help humanity and make technology and lives easier for people. Looking back 20 or 30 years, what were some of the most surprising things you've encountered with gallium nitrate or even other materials? 
I brought it up kind of a little bit earlier already, which was that gallium nitride works despite it having so many imperfections inside. And it still now has so many imperfections. If you take the same number of imperfections and trying to build a silicon device or a gallium, nit gallium arsenide device with the same number of imperfections, it wouldn't work. You could say gallium nitride defies physics or defies engineering. It doesn't. There are some reasons from the physics side why these imperfections do not matter so much for gallium nitride. And that has baffled me at the time when I was getting into that field. Surprised me. I didn't think it's going to work either. And that, it still baffles me now. And that's one of the exciting parts actually working in gallium nitride. Yeah, life is full of surprises. So what would someone that is starting off in chemistry, physics, or any other STEM field that's interested in these kind of topics and these types of technology, what type of skills are crucial to go from research to product or to make research commercially viable and put them into the hands of consumers? And when I'm referring to this, I always use the example of Russia back in the communist days versus the West, where Russia was extremely good at research and invention, but really bad at innovation. So innovation is basically taking invention and making that commercially viable and making profits off of that. What, what are some of the crucial skills I have to have in order to make an invention or research commercially viable? A certain openness in mind, talking to people, talking to people across different countries. I mean, Russia, for example, was always a quite close society at that moment in time. If you go back, for example, in Russia, some good examples. Russia has always done amazing research in making, for example, diamond, artificial diamond. The time when Russia was closed, it will never was never going a commercial business. Um, nowadays, when Russia is open now, there's an increasing number of companies coming out from Russia who actually sell diamonds or are in the diamond market. So an openness of a researcher to talk to people who use, for example, take the example of gallium nitride, the gallium nitride product. What do you want? What do you need? Then go back in the lab and play around with the material, but keeping in mind where people could use it. That's probably a skill, and that's not an easy skill. Also, the ability to talk to and to entrepreneurs, to talk to people from other disciplines. Not an easy to skill, but very exciting. The ability to talk from people to other cultures, which is obviously now probably more open than 20, 30 years ago. All these are skill sets which actually matter a lot in actually making this transition university research to some commercial application. And there are also equally more incentives from governments to give people money to do that. Yeah, that's being user centric. And that's even very hard for established successful companies that always claim, well, we know what the customer wants, instead of really taking, as you say, an open mind and, and asking what is the actual need behind what the customer wants. So yeah, I definitely can, can agree to that, uh, that that's a skill that, you know, every scientist should have. On, on the other, the flip side, what are some of the most frustrating or counterproductive things that someone has to deal with when they're in this field? I mean, to follow on from what I said earlier, one of the frustrating things, obviously, if you have commercialization and company size, many companies think on a one or two year cycle. If you develop a new technology like gallium nitride to power converters, it takes 10, 20 years. So there's a tension between what a product, okay, how much time is there to develop a product and how much actually it takes time to really develop the underlying component. So that can be frustrating. So you need to find the right people who have the openness to recognize some things just take time and to have some patience in it. Obviously, what you also have in addition, what can be frustrations and not frustration, there's some technologies which are very hype and very driven, which take some attention away from, like say, power electronics. Power electronics is, would make our lives as society extremely better. But from the outside, people think it's not exciting, but it is very exciting and because other areas are a bit overhyped. Yeah, I think that's just the general expectations we as consumers have. Because we get phones every year, we expect every technology to move along equally as fast. And I can remember, obviously, this was a very different time in the late 80s, maybe. I saw, I was watching television as a young boy and then heard something called ABS, Active Braking System, and they were testing it. I think it was 
was Mercedes-Benz at that time, were testing it in their trucks. And I, I remember how long it took for that to reach the ordinary car that the so not luxury luxury sedans and i think there's just a, a very we, we do research as a disservice by expecting these huge technological jumps within a few years or months or, or whatever instead of you know appreciating that groundbreaking innovations take time they take time to research and often Consumers don't know what how long you know research really takes. That's a point where maybe I can get your view on that as well. Is where Germany, at least historically, seemed to be extremely strong, is laying the foundations of groundbreaking technologies. And the U.S. has traditionally, at least, been very, very good at commercializing existing technologies. Is that still the case? Is uh, Germany still uh, very strong in laying the foundation? Really strong in in research, or has that changed? Over the last decades? I mean, there have been certainly shifts. I mean, I've seen the research culture in Germany because I studied in Germany originally and I studied on a project which was funded by a German car manufacturer. And that was industry funding, which at that point was very unusual in Germany. So the building of industry funding, a nice illustration was in the corner of the campus, far away from everything else. Then I moved to the US and studied there and everything was very industry relation focused. I was working on the first blue laser dyes at that time. It was a collaboration between Brown University, where I worked, which is on the East Coast, and the main LED manufacturer so laser dyed manufacturer in the US. And I could see actually the interaction between university and industry much more being active in the US. And then I moved to England, where it's also very active into industry university interaction. But I've seen also Germany has moved quite a bit along in increasing university industry interaction. So I think there's still room for improvement in Germany and benefits to reap in. So this next question is probably going to be more over simplification or over generalization. But I'd still want to get your view on that, which is I think it's every researcher's dream to have unlimited funding and have no restrictions placed upon the research. But getting funding for something like that is probably very difficult. So if you have commercial interests involved that kind of dictate what you can and cannot research, it's easy to get funding. But then on the other hand side, you have all these constraints, which might also kind of dictate the results. So what's your opinion on that? I mean, that's a hard, it's a good question, but equally a hard question to answer because it's, as you said, quite generalized. And so if you, you need, let's start from this end. Obviously, you need fundam- you need researchers who do fundamental research irrespective of the application. So in the end, people play around, they discover interesting things and they think maybe it's useful, maybe not. Then you need researchers who are able to actually take these fundamental inventions to think about what they may be useful for. And then you need researchers who actually really implement these inventions into real application. If you cut, for example, off the fundamental researchers completely, you would lose the feed-in of new ideas into new technologies in 20 years' time. There's a balance across the food chain. I personally started my career in doing surface science, which had zero application. I wasn't interested in application at that point. And I found it then exciting working in the U.S., seeing, oh, what I've done is actually very useful for light-emitting dyes at that moment in time, or now for electronic devices. So it's you need all parts of the food chain to actually really work, and each individual person can actually fit in. And I personally find it exciting to realize, I studied a physicist, I probably do more engineering now, to realize what I'm actually doing as a physicist is useful for something. And when I work with a company, I always find a balance so that there's going to be some benefit for the company, but equally, I, I can generate ideas which for the company may not be resulting in a benefit tomorrow, but maybe in five years' time. Yeah, I can definitely see that being very gratifying to see your research being applied and being used by, by consumers or even helping save lives, whatever that product is. If, if you look back in, in, in your career, what were some of the, the biggest breakthroughs you had as a, as a researcher? Usually the, the, uh, the breakthroughs you're doing are coming from unplanned things or you play around. So for me, science and engineering is you just you play around 
experimenting different things which may work or not so um so what we've done about many years ago was the following i was working on a technique called raman spectroscopy so what this technique is a fundamental physics technique you shine a laser on a material the laser atom the, la the laser photons so the laser particles hit the material and they get scattered back and some of it gets it's the same wavelength as a laser but some of it gets scattered back in a slightly different wave wavelength which is related that you hit the atoms in the material and calls those photons and this is what you measure with the technique, technique Raman spectroscopy. And what we thought at that point was, why not using this technique not on standard materials, the gallium nitride material, but trying to find, looking at a gallium nitride device, what would we see? We didn't, we thought there could be some interesting stuff in there. And what we actually saw then, if I have a device switched off or switch it on, something changes in what I record with that Raman spectroscopy. And with this, we invented a technique, which is called Raman thermography, where we can actually measure temperature in little tiny transistors with high spatial means less than a micron spatial resolution which no one could ever do before and that's very relevant for if one people want to figure out how long a device will actually live and this was a very surprise at that moment in time and no one tried this before and in hindsight it's actually very once you discovered it you could say this is evident this is easy why did no one try this before and this is what i find always the most things one is most proud of simple ideas which then everybody else can understand and use. And lots of people use the technique now. Yeah, I think this comes back to my earlier comment about giving researchers more leverage or just the space to do research without any strings attached to it. Give them a small fund or a small grant and they can do whatever they like with it. Similar to companies. And even for companies, it's hard to give employees the space to just try things out because most of the time, the more things you try, the more likely you are to find something surprising or you're able to find a breakthrough, you know, similar with post-its. They were looking or 3M was looking for a new compound uh, for, for a glue and it didn't stick very well. And then out came this successful failure, which is uh, post-its or Viagra or YouTube started off as a dating platform and then they failed miserably or they actually failed successfully, if you will. So I think we need to give not only employees, but also researchers much more of a playground where they can try things out and be more in this what uh, psychologists or some scientists have called the diffuse mode. So you have the focus mode of your brain and the diffuse mode where you're not actively focusing on anything, but you know, have that brilliant idea in the shower because rarely your best ideas come at the workplace or in the lab. So we need to give, I think, researchers and employees much more leeway in, in trying and experimenting. I would agree with that fully. I mean, unfortunately, nowadays society and funding works in the direction it gets more focused. So if people do it intelligent, you can still do things like that. I mean, I agree, one has needs to have the space to play around with because you find the unexpected. Okay. The tricky is the, the challenging is to, to then actually recognize the unexpected. And then you're also willing to try things out which you think will never succeed. Like many years ago we tried to combine gallium nitride and diamond, I mentioned that earlier. I didn't expect it to work, but it's just worth trying out and now it's actually a very useful technology for high power RF and power devices. So you need that space to and funding to do this, obviously, to enable that. And that needs to come back, in my opinion. I think this is something where companies need to learn from scientists. So when scientists have an idea, they go out and say, okay, what is the hypothesis? What hypothesis do we need to test? And either they're right or they're wrong. They don't say, well, they failed. Similar to Edison, he said he didn't fail 500 times. He was just 500 times closer to the end result, which was the light bulb. So I think here the companies need to learn that innovation is not linear. Innovation can rarely be planned, but it can be done in a systematic way where I can start to test intelligent hypothesis. And even if I fail, I learn. I learned something from the hypothesis, from the prototype that I have. And I think there the companies need and can learn a lot from the scientific approach. I mean, I tell my PhD students, for example, often or postdocs, you learn sometimes more by something not working. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's the right mindset to instill into uh, students or uh, future researchers. To wrap this up, what are some of the most important things you would like the listeners to take away from this episode? I mean, first, the technology is fun and also important to reduce basically how impacts of humans are in nature to make our lives better. The gallium nitride is actually very exciting material which will only increase in how much we use it and with this we save some energies reduce our carbon footprint that there's still many opportunities to come in gallium nitride but also in other materials like gallium oxide and that is also very important actually for our future developments the young generation saying physics engineering your science all these areas are actually really cool areas to go into and there are lots of job opportunities and creative opportunities in this. And we need those new young people to actually come in in Europe and the US, Asia, and help. I mean, obviously have fun and help society. So if there's listeners out there that found this podcast episode really interesting in the topic and want to delve deeper into the research or want to contact you, uh, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Just drop me an email or my email address. Contact me via LinkedIn if you want to connect via LinkedIn. We post a lot of updates what we do in research. The same in Twitter, we do that. People see what happens. So is there something that uh, I didn't touch on or forgot to ask you that I should have mentioned or that you want to maybe add? The only thing that I said before, I mean, science and engineering is actually fun. And it's actually, I feel sometimes underappreciate how much fun it can be. Is it easy? No. Is it rewarding very much? Um, one has the opportunity to meet people from all different cultures. And that's very eye-opening. You learn a lot how humans humans are. Well, those were perfect closing remarks. So thanks for all the fascinating insights into research and gallium nitrite. And uh, yeah, thanks for being on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your time as well. I enjoyed it a lot. So we reached that segment again where I try to summarize the interview and give you some of my thoughts. As we've seen with gallium nitrate technology, it's slightly more expensive than silicon. Not dramatically so, but if we built the whole system using gallium nitrate technology, it's actually much, much cheaper than using silicon, but with better performance. But the problem is actually systemic. Silicon is really cheap. It's ubiquitous and companies trust the material. And there's an entire electronics industry built on the material. Right now, creating gallium nitrite is expensive. You often have to use a lot of pressure or get very high temperatures in order to grow gallium nitrite crystals. And the growing process can lead to a lot of defects, as Martin mentioned in this episode, which means you need even more to get enough of the useful stuff, so to speak. So the main obstacle for widespread adoption is essentially trust. Companies need to get used to this new material and very disruptive technology. They need to replace and optimize the whole electronics around an existing product, and that can take some time. But they also tend to be very conservative. And however, this adoption is slowly happening right now. But also that will take some time. Some companies are trying to grow GAN on top of silicon, as Martin also briefly mentioned. They are currently trying to use their platforms and equipment they already have, but even that also takes some time. And so for now, manufacturer will have to cope with multiple kinds of semiconductors. But the important thing to remember here is there are some application where it's better to use silicon than gallium nitrite. And there's other materials called silicon carbides that also has its benefits and drawbacks or just as gallium oxide. That leaves so much more room for scientists like Martin to explore and see what they can come up with. It will still take some time for gallium nitrite to take over the world, but the market does seem to be growing, and I'm really excited to see what's in store for the future. And if you want to experience gallium nitrite for yourself, go out and buy a gallium nitrite charger from a reputable manufacturer and uh, be astonished of what that little thing can do. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's plenty more where that came from. Just head to our podcast website, innovationalcorrectness.com or gammabeyond.com, or just follow us on LinkedIn. There you will also find long-form articles, videos, and other podcast episodes about innovation and transformation. And if I could ask you for one small favor, it would be this. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Overcast, or the podcast app of your choice. It really helps us out by encouraging more people to find our podcast and reach hard-to-get guests. Last but not least, if you have any suggestions, 
suggestions for further episodes or guests that we should invite on our podcast or just have feedback, you have three options. Emailing us at info at gammabeyond.com, filling out our anonymous feedback form at innovationalcorrectness.com, or leaving us a voice message with your question or feedback so that it can be included in the podcast and all listeners can profit. Just go to innovationalcorrectness.com. Links are in the show notes. I've been your host, David Luna. Until next time.